This next position is taken from the game of a student of mine, Lee Gardner. Lee is a very, very talented young chess player. He actually recently won the Pan Am Games, which is a big tournament, and he got a full scholarship for four years at Texas University, which he's very excited about. He's a wonderful human being, a very, very talented chess player, and we've been doing a lot of work on his games, noticing psychological themes, trying to improve upon certain chess ideas. He had the black pieces in this position, and his opponent played h4. And somehow at this point, Lee decided that his position was very bad. Now, it's easy to notice that white is pressuring black. White has a little bit more central space. White was playing h4. It looks like a very aggressive move. Maybe he wants to play h5, h6. He wants to attack. But truth be told, black's game is perfectly fine. There's nothing to worry about. But what happened to Lee here is that he couldn't figure out what to do. He saw that if knight g6, the guy was going to play h5. He saw that the guy was pushing him back. Lee decided that his position was very bad. He made a materialistic judgment. This is a very interesting tendency that he has, and I think we could all learn from it. He judged the position with a finality that was unnecessary. Instead of taking the game as one that was, you know, he has a slightly worse position, but it's a struggle, and the other guy will move, and then I'll move, and we'll go back and forth, and whoever makes the better moves will win. Whoever deals with each situation as it presents itself will gain the upper hand. Instead of looking at it that way, the way he looked at it was, my position is very bad, and here he kind of froze, and Lee is a very strong chess player. If you look up any of his games in a database, you'll see excellent wins that he, he beats very strong players. But here you'll notice that because of his decision that the position was very bad, he was unable to solve the problems that actually weren't that hard. Let's take a look at how. First of all, he played knight g6, a move that doesn't really do much because after h5 he's going to have to go right back. He had the very strong possibility of queen a4, slightly unusual looking, very dynamic move attacking the rook on d1, and pressuring the a2 pawn. Now this might seem a little bit unimportant from one perspective, because it's only a small pawn on the edge of the board, but in this type of closed game where things are happening very slowly, a pawn can prove decisive. If the rook does something active, like rook d6 or something like that, he can simply take the pawn. If the guy tries to defend the thing with rook a1, Lee is taking control of the d-file, gains some activity, and there's no question that his game is perfectly fine. So with one active move, like queen a4, Black's game would have been excellent. Lee played knight g6. After h5, he played knight e7. Moves that didn't really do that much. Knight on f8 is an excellent defensive piece. And if you're worried about the attack, you should leave it on f8. After knight e7, Lee's opponent played rook takes d8. An error. There's no reason to ever give up control of the d-file like that. Lee took back, rook takes d8. And here he played h6. So now black to play. Your move. What would you do? This is a perfect example of how somebody can get frozen by thinking their position is worse than it actually is. By making a final judgment, like, oh no, I'm lost, or I'm much worse, or I'm busted, as opposed to I'm simply playing chess. If you look at it from here, Lee has control of the d-file. His queen can jump out to a4, attack and weaknesses which are quite hard to defend. His knight can come to f5 if it wants to, or g6 if it wants to. Albeit, rook takes d8 allowed many of these things. It was a bad move by white. Now the guy plays h6. Now, Lee was still under the psychological spell of being worse. And because of that judgment, he didn't even really think about the most obvious move, which is g takes h6, after which black is perfectly fine. There's no real way for white to continue the attack. Black can put a knight on f5 if he wants to. g4 will be very, very weakening to kick it off. The knight on g6 can never be kicked away anymore because the h-pawn is gone. Lee has control of the d-file, and it should be mentioned he's up a pawn. If white played queen h4, knight f5 comes with tempo, attacking the queen. Black's game is very good. So after the simple moves g takes h6, black would have an excellent position. And Lee is a very strong chess player. He would have found that no problem. All that was between him and the obvious move was a cloudy emotional state, a psychology that was based on already evaluating the position with unwarranted finality. Because Lee had somehow already given the game to his opponent, he played g6, trusting the other guy's idea. And now what is a very strong pawn in h6, but it's not over yet. Queen f4. Lee's opponent went on with the idea of playing queen f6 to g7 mate. Okay, that's his idea, but there's a lot that can be done about it. Here Lee made another mistake. He could play the move knight f5, which blocks the queen from getting in. Then white would have to play g4. Lee could play knight d4, offer a trade. His opponent would play knight g5, and then after queen e7, knight e4, some people would look at this position and think that white is winning, but it's not true. 
The point is that the only real entry into black's position is the f6 square. There's only one way to get in. The queen can't really go there because black can always trade off. And if the knight goes there, the black king simply moves. If white could have both the queen and the knight simultaneously on f6, then of course it would be winning, but there's no way to do that. And so black's position is fine. White's attacking position is very, very limited by the fact that he only has one entry point. Black is fine. But on the other hand, that's a very subtle judgment. To make such a decision as to allow white to get such a bind on f6 with all these different pieces requires a clear head. You have to see, okay, he can get there, but I see that he can't do anything with it. There's no way to make such a judgment when you've already decided your position is very bad, when you're unhappy, when you don't have much confidence, and Lee was not in the right psychological state. After knight c6, Lee allowed his opponent in with queen f6. Now he had to be a little more passive. Queen f8 and knight g5. Now obviously it would have been much better if Lee could have had his queen on e7 so that white couldn't have gotten to this dominant position. But still, truth be told, black is just fine. The only thing that made this position decisive for white is that black believed it was decisive for white. And that's why I bring this position into the discussion. Materialism. If you make a materialistic judgment, you put even if it's only subconsciously, a finality on your vision of the game which should not exist. The truth about chess is that it's a tremendously complicated struggle. Almost all of the time, when students of mine have shown me their games, when they say now I was winning, the opponent missed four chances to get back in the game, and when they say now I'm losing, they missed four chances to get back in the game. There's always another shot. So when you find yourself closing off your mind to the struggle, giving the an evaluation to the game which doesn't allow you to fight anymore, take a deep breath and think deeper. This is a position like that. What would you do? If you judge this position with a clear head, what you would see is that although white's pieces look very, very strong, and believe me, they do, I know it. White has a knight on g5, a queen on f6, the black queen can't move. The truth of the matter is that white can't do anything with it. The f7 square is defended by the black queen. If the white knight moves, then black can take on h6. If the queen moves, the h6 pawn will fall as long as f7 is defended. Black has complete control of the d-file, and he has a very active knight and a very active rook. Black's game is just fine. If he plays the very strong move rook d2, someone could even make the argument that black is better, even after everything that happened. The b2 pawn is attacked. If it moves, the a2 pawn goes. If white plays the super passive rook b1, then moves like knight d4 can come in. Look at the black knight and the black rook. They're completely centrally placed. Black can also choose to play rook e2 to try to pile up on the e5 square if he wants to, although I wouldn't recommend it because rook d1 can take control of the crucial d-file if black's not careful. This type of position is simply excellent for black. I should also point out that he has the possibility of playing knight f5, which has the effect of trapping the white queen in on a central square. Then you can also take the pawn on h6 with your knight. Black could very easily prove that white was overextended. Now you might have noticed a tactic and wondered why it didn't work, but just take a minute and make sure you see it. If white had tried after rook d2, knight takes e6, f takes e6, queen takes e6, with the idea of forking king and knight, it doesn't quite work, because after king h8, queen takes c6, this was much of the idea of rook d2. The black queen and rook are on the f2 square, and after queen f2 check, black wins by force, because after king h2, queen h4 check, king g1, you can take the rook on e1 with check. There's no chance for white to take advantage of the back rank, and black wins. So you see that rook d2 is at once an active move, taking over the 7th rank, attacking the b2 pawn, planning the knight to come into the game, and it also responds to a precise tactic that white had in mind. Knight takes e6. Such decisions require a clear head, and Liu again would have found this easily if he had been open to the fact that the game was a hard chess struggle. But instead, Li was colored by the fact that the other guy had pushed the pawn all the way up the board, a queen actively placed, a knight actively placed, he was confused. He wasn't looking at the game from a clear perspective. And he played knight d4, which is a decisive error for a tactical reason. Do you see how white can win now? After knight d4, white played the very strong tactic, knight takes f7. And now black really is in trouble. He can't take back the knight because the rook on d8 hangs. And after rook d7, knight g5, black's best shot will be to the queen takes f6 check, trade off queens and try to hold the endgame, but he's still in very big trouble there. Lee played queen takes h6, knight takes e6, and after knight f5, white has a winning move. Try to find it. Do you see what it is? The point is that all of black's pieces are really holding on just by the skin of their teeth, and it really can't hold up anymore. 
the most vulnerable piece is the queen on h6, which is defending mate on f8. So I can force it to leave by playing g4. If the in-between move rook f7, then queen d8 check obviously wins. And after knight d4, g5, the black queen has to move off of the f8 square, because g7 is covered. And when the queen moves, then queen f8 is mate. So in this position, after g4, Lee resigned. So Lee is a very, very strong chess player. And all of the moves that I showed you that he could have played in a normal chess game, or if I gave it to him as a problem, he'd be able to solve without any question, and very quickly. What held him back was judging the position with unwarranted finality, closing his mind to the possibility of all the rich things that he could find. And with a mind that's half-closed, we can't play good chess.